Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome. Uh, my name's Lucy Myers. I'm the director of Lund Humphreys, and um, I'm really delighted to welcome you on behalf of Lund Humphreys and our partners, Artifacts Press and Chelsea College of Arts, to our symposium, The Catalogue Resume in the 21st Century. Um, we believe this is the first event of its kind in the UK, certainly on this scale, and we're very excited to have so many people here today. <laughs> Um, I'm also delighted that we have a really distinguished panel of speakers here who have come from the US, from Germany, as well as the UK, so I think it's going to be a very exciting day. Um, a few people have asked how we're documenting the day. Uh, firstly, we will be filming everything, and there will be a film that we'll make available on the Lund Humphreys website and the Artifacts Press website, and we'll email you to let you know when that's available. Um, we're also planning a book a handbook about how to compile a catalogue resume. Um, that's a longer term project, but if you'd like to be kept informed, I think the best way is to sign up to the Lund Humphreys email newsletter. And there's a pink card in all the Lund Humphreys bags telling you how to do that. Um, finally, I'm delighted to introduce our chair for the day, uh, Dr. Nicholas Tromans, who is a seasoned curator, author, conference chair, and is curator of the Watts Gallery in Compton, Surrey. And Nick is um, going to introduce the subject of our day, the catalogue resume in the 21st century. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Anyone who's had a chance yet, and I hope that's most of you, to have a look at the schedule will see that it's uh, quite an intricate piece of machinery. And I think that that is primarily my job today, is to try and keep us on the schedule and make sure that you all get as much as you possibly can out of the day. We're going to begin with three uh, keynote introductions to the subject of the catalogue resume from three very different perspectives. But thereafter, we are almost entirely going to be based around panels of two or three uh, participants up here at the front. It's going to be a day of uh, conversation, and that will absolutely include uh, yourselves. And I think that's my prime message, that could you all please make sure to think of some good questions, because there is a lot of time that we have very carefully crafted into this piece of machinery to allow you to ask all the questions that you may wish to on any aspect of the catalogue resume. Also, of course, there are these breakout periods, not least the lunch, where we hope you will buttonhole uh, people who you find interesting or who are working on subjects which are close to your own hearts, and that we can go away from today uh, feeling that we're all better connected. I think that when this idea was first mooted by uh, the people at Lund Humphreys and Artifacts, what we all wanted to achieve was to overcome perhaps something of the, the loneliness of the long-distance runner, uh, which the catalogue resume so often uh, appears to be from the point of view of a, a literary genre. It is a, a kind of bloody-minded literary genre, isn't it, along the lines of a, a long-distance endurance event. Um, and I think what we're doing today is, first of all, demystifying that myth, because, in fact, of course, no one really does it single-handedly. Everybody needs a team around them, and we're going to pick about finding how those teams are actually put together and how these projects continue to be delivered. And indeed, I think one of the things we're looking at today is uh, that sense of the miraculous, really, that the catalogue resume not only continues to exist, but flourishes after a period when we were told the work of art had dematerialized. And so how are we supposed to continue to catalogue it at all? I think that's an important question. What is motoring still? the uh, catalogue resume. So please do enjoy the panel conversations. Please do participate in them. Uh, we may have to pass microphones around. It'll be a bit messy, but we hope that that will increase the sense of this being a sort of team effort today and not yourselves simply being spectators. So thank you. Now, without further ado, we are going to move on to three uh, solo papers, and the first of those is going to be given by Dr. David Anfam, who uh, I'm going to completely try to make blush now by describing him as something of a heroic figure in the recent history of the catalogue resume, having completed the Mark Rothko catalogue. And of course, that word, having completed, is in its, that phrase is in itself quite, quite the achievement for any catalogue resume. And he is also the guest curator of the Royal Academy's current abstract expressionist exhibition, which has just got the kind of reviews that anyone who works in the museum would give a limb for. So, David, congratulations on that exhibition. Uh, we're delighted to, to have you here just to give a, uh, a few 
uh, minutes introduction. I know you're not feeling on top of the world today, so we're going to invite you to speak from a seat if everyone is. Yes, I really must apologize if, um, if I'm not looking or sounding like my usual stalwart self, but I'm, I'm really feeling pretty awful, to say the least. There are, uh, in my opinion, there are two types of catalogues raisonné. They're both equally valid, but um, potentially very, very, very different. And the one type is really essentially an, an agglomeration of facts, hard facts. And they're, they're out there, there's no question about it. And I'm sure that there will continue to be catalogues raisonné of that kind. Um, the second type is where the hard facts start to interact with all sorts of factoids, possibilities, uncertainties, opinions, and even uh, life experiences. Now, I, I have a very soft spot for the second type. I almost like to call it the romantic catalogue raisonné. It should have a backbone of extreme uh, rigour, but then there should be plenty of juicier, even, you know, um, uncertain things around that backbone. Uh, I, uh, it looks like, if I, if I last long enough, it looks like I'd be doing both types of catalogue raisonné, because um, Mark Rothko's catalogue raisonné was um, absolutely, I should be pressing this, there we go, yes. The uh, Mark Rothko catalogue raisonné was absolutely um, the second type of catalogue raisonné. Um, whereas what we're beginning now at the Clifford Still Museum in Denver is completely different. The thing about Rothko is no damned documentation. There's 836, or it's now 837 and a half paintings. <laughs> <laughs> because one and a half paintings came to light uh, long after I finished doing it and published in 1998. But Rothko was one of those people who kept no records, or virtually no records at all. Whereas Clifford Still documented with his daughters and his wife everything down to virtually his underwear. And it's all, it's all in Denver. And the Clifford Still archive occupies a, a fair-sized room in itself so, you know, I'm trying to show you that there are these polar opposites and there's also a lot of grey area in between those types of catalogue raisonnés. In my case, um, catalogue raisonné changed my life because, as you'll see at the bottom, in the middle, I was actually, thanks to Margaret Thatcher, uh, with a PhD from Courtauld, I was pretty much unemployed for ten years, except for... <laughs> except for the chance to write my first Thames and Hudson World of Art book on a little typewriter. And uh, to keep myself fairly sane, um, I, I took two allotments, and there I am, looking shabby on the first allotment. <laughs> and above is David Ampham transformed, looking like a very man of the world, uh, on the balcony of a National Gallery of Art, looking extremely dapper, and I must say, I'm fairly young, too. Um, um, and, of course, Rothko, you know, Rothko has become incredibly iconic. And, you know, there's a Rothko postage stamp put out in America. And, and one of the most interesting things to look at is at the lower right, lower left, excuse me, you'll notice a table, and you should be able to see, I'm afraid my hands are very shaky there, um, the, the volume, as, as, as several art dealers said, the book. And that, that's standing in the... Uh, in the apartment of Ambassador Donald Blenken. And this was in a, a very glossy, I can't remember, I think it was in Vogue, actually, this article. So, you know, catalogues raisonné, they're very powerful in more ways than one. And, um, and I just want to say that the, the Rothko took, hold on, um, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? So, the Rothko took about, uh, well, it was that net time was, was almost nine years in Washington. But there were one or two bits and pieces before that and after that. And it's quite interesting because although I formally began to Rothko uh, on the 1st of March 1989, two years before that I'd already been contacted by um, 
Something of a lunatic of a man, with one of the worst fakes I've ever seen. And that's been going on, it's still going on, it's still going on. And it's, it's worth bearing in mind, you have to be very, very, very careful what you do, what you say, and the effect that may, may have. And also, in my experience, um, it's terribly easy to be misconstrued. Because I really want to stand up and say, go home, this doesn't look anything like a Rothko at all, it's a, it's a bad fake. But because I never said that, well, I actually did tell him it wasn't right. Um, but because I never had a chance and I couldn't say that, that's why it's still going on. So this, this area of caution and silence and, and uh, reticence, it, it also causes problems. And, and that man's driving a certain woman up a wall uh, who worked with Rothko, and it's, it's still going on. Um, the other thing about it is that um, I think it's... You, you, have to, you have to go where angels fear to tread with a catalog raising sometimes. And in my case, I was so naive when I started it, but I did all sorts of things which, looking back now, I think would be absolutely incredibly dangerous in terms of the legalities and so forth. But that, that was part of my uh, know-nothing intrepidness, I think, in many ways. Um, I just want a few anecdotes because um, it's... Uh, it's interesting. One is that once the catalogue raisonné was published in 1998, auction prices began to go up and up and up. For a classic Rothko for the 1950s, pre to 1998, you were talking something like, well, if you were lucky, $20 million. We're getting on more than that. But then when Rockefeller, David Rockefeller's painting, that's David Rockefeller up the top top right. When that came up for sale, that was after the catalogue raising and it was published, I think it was 99 or, or 2000, I don't know, I can't remember. But that broke a new record because it went up to 75 million. And some, someone made money, not me. Um, but um, the point I'm making is that the catalogue raising has an effect on uh, the artist's reputation and on the artist's prices and all sorts of similar things of that kind. Um, there were, I mean, I did, I did the Rothko on a wing and a prayer. It was like, it was like a plane made out of wooden canvas, but it still flew. And, and I'm not in any way against um, the technology, which has which boomed since then. But I do want to say that I think um, a catalogue raising could still be done without a massive high technology. And then and some of the greatest catalogue raisonnés in my field, for example, like Pollock, Jackson Pollock, the R. Shield Gorky catalogue raisonné, they were done, literally, on file cards like that, you know. And then they're not necessarily taken any longer than someone who's doing it now, so it's very interesting. I also had some extraordinary experiences, and if I live long enough, I'll, I'll write my autobiography. Because just to give you one example, um, David Rockefeller there, that's the rock building at the Rockefeller Center, went there with a conservator, very narrow at the top, that went there with a conservator, saw a 1950 Rothko, huge number of, um, of um, screws with, on the backing. So we spent like half an hour getting out of some 50 odd screws, something like that. I thought, oh, I said to Dana Kramer, oh, I've just got it here now. And a door opened, and there was David Rockefeller. <laughs> And it's just, I never expected to meet David Rockefeller at the top of the rock. <laughs> and afterwards, I said, so I said to Dana Kramer, I said, can you believe it? She said, no, absolutely not. And we were surrounded by screws. Um, in, other, in other cases, I got to, 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 to places where people simply almost never get to. And at the lower left, that's um, Bunny Mellon's Oak Spring Library, with, with one of the largest of all um, totally classic 50s Rothkos, the uh, yellow, orange, and red. In another case, I got to Chateau Petrus, and I got a bottle of a 1989 as well. And, um, you know, it's quite interesting because of the Petrus Rothko, which happens to be the one on the cover of the catalogue raisonné. Um, it was supposed to be discreetly sold earlier, earlier last year, and it was discreetly sold, and it was sold for 80 million. But it was then sold again by the same dealer for 180 million. 
and the dealer's now being sued by the Russian oligarch who has it. And um, as, as the news was all over Bloomberg. So, you know, it's, it's, this is, these are the fortunes of paintings. But last of all, I had a very interesting experience with um, Hubert de Givenchy at the top, top, top left. Um, I went to his uh, hotel in Paris near the Musée Rodin and um, 10 o'clock in the morning and saw him, very tall, suntan chap, and very charming, poured me out a beaker of wine, not in a wine glass, but in something like that. I don't know, softened me up or something, saw the painting, and he said, oh, um, is this okay? I said, oh, very beautiful. And said, will it be in the catalogue resume? I said, oh, absolutely. Son question. And um, I, I will never sell my painting. I love it so much. Two weeks later, it was with the dealer, dealer uh, Ernst Beiler. <coughs> sold it right away. Um, but let me get on a bit more. <laughs> Oops. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it was Yes. Um, something that's very interesting. I think to some extent, doing catalog raising is, is a lot about mental geography. And, and you start as you're going through it, assuming it's a single author catalog raising. Uh, there's two types. There's one is a more editorial board type with um, several people doing it, and the other one is with an intrepid single author. And um, that's where I was in Washington, and that was my office up there. And um, gradually, I started to accumulate Polaroids on the right, you see. And I was able, the office was so large that in the end, before making the final decisions about ordering every work, particularly within the same year, at the end, I could lay out 835 Polaroids in two rows in that office. And um, I don't know if you could do that on a computer or a Mac. Maybe we'll hear more about that later. But it could certainly be done physically without high technology. Uh, let me see now. Oh, there's another issue here. Um, and technology is what works for you. If, if you feel you're better off with a pen than a keyboard, then you're better off with that, you know. Um, the... Uh, the other thing is it was done, in my case, on, uh, on a, a, a Q&A &A 4. And you probably, probably haven't even heard of it now, but one of the earlier databases. And it did a few things, but it also made, it was incredibly clunky to work with. And by the end, by 1998, I, I, I began to wish we'd put the whole thing onto a wholly different kind of tailor-made software. Um, there's also the issue of institutions. Um, versus privately sponsored catalogues raisonné. I mean, this was, this was sponsored by the National Gallery of Art. But there are other cases where it's, it's an artist's estate who does it. And in my experience, the, the friction between the scholar and the National Gallery of Art was absolutely enormous. And I, I won't go into too many details, but by the time I left Washington in 1997, someone very high up there said to him, send me a fax saying, as far as we're concerned, you have absolutely no scholarly cred credibility whatsoever. And uh, <laughs> that's how it was. And said, we're perfectly prepared to publish the catalogue raisonné without any introductory text. Um, that was where Yale University Press came in, uh, John Nichol, and saved the day but by, 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 the, by the distance of a cat's whisker. The um, thing about Rothko, as I was saying, is 835 paintings, give or take a few, and of that, almost exactly half, or 300, were totally undated. He didn't date a single thing until around 1950. Um, so he was systematically unsystematic because he often gave his numbers on the back. You can see the numbers there. And then on top of that, there were the uh, so-called estate numbers, which were given to uh, the paintings. Uh, well, not just before Rothko died, when his whole estate was inventoried. But the trouble with this is that the, uh, the Rothko dates, when they appear, they're not necessarily accurate. Uh, Rothko, uh, read between my, li uh, my lines, Rothko was a very heavy drinker. And he didn't always put quite the right dates on the back. And often, often, because the uh, inventory 
which was done in 19, uh, 19, oh, me, 1970, the winter of 1979. It was done in a big hurry. And those dates, like 5 or 18.5, or sometimes they're accurate, sometimes they weren't. Um, there's also, when you're doing it, what I had to face was trying to integrate and induce facts and ideas from a whole mass of data. And for example, there was no dating on Rothko's mother, but we knew, know she was born in 1870. And she looks, as I said to uh, Christopher Rothko, she looks about 60s there. So that takes us to circa 1929, 31. It's not absolutely certain. I mean, she may just be looking 60 and actually 80. But, um, you know, that's the, um, that's the way it is. There are other interesting things, for example, um, you see the painting down below? It's called The Road, um, down lower left. No, excuse me, lower right. Well, this is what I believe a really thorough scholar should do. That painting was just known as The Road and had no idea where it was or what it was, and, and I, I suspect certain types of scholars doing catalogues raising it might not want to probe into that area at all or just publish it as the road. But I went to see Rothko's Brownstone House at 1000 Park Place, upper right, and I thought I'd take a walk around from there. Very dangerous area. But I walked down to Nostrand Avenue, and I think if you look very carefully, oops, excuse me, uh, at the end of Nostrand, Nostrand Avenue is a red brick turreted army. And so we know exactly where that is. That's the up, uh, that elevated line is still there. And, and in turn, looking through all the files, the road was the number one painting in Rothko's first ever show, one man show in New York in 1933. And this makes me think that um, it had to be painted around 1932-33. Simple as that. In a way, you know, it becomes like a kind of criminal investigation. It's forensic evidence. And if, if this is a difficult artist, you know... Oh, excuse me. And then um, there's all these... Um, one of the ways which, in which, in which um, I establish datings and things like that, always look at the signatures. I mean, the signatures are incredibly important in Rothko's case because they changed about four times throughout his life. He was born in 1903, died in 1970. And the early signatures, I, I, I built up a series of works that all had that same kind of signature, so you could start grouping them together and getting a rough idea of a chronology. Um, at the National Gallery, there, there were a load of discarded Rothko strainers, lower right, and they were going to chuck them. And I said, don't chuck them, for God's sake. I want to look at every single piece of wood in case there were inscriptions, and very often there were. You have to be hands-on, I think, in some cases. And then you take something like the, uh, the Rothko at lower left, on the left, at lower left. Uh, something told me that this was based on another painting, and there's no question it was based on Edward Hopper's Chop Suey, a famous painting. That was exhibited at Rain Gallery in New York tw on 21st of January, 1929. So I, that makes a terminus postquem. It's as simple as that. I, I, I would suggest it was probably done around... 1929, 1930. And what I'm going to say is also there's, there's no certainty in all these issues. Um, but again, I, I, think, I think it's also very much um, responsibility to continue the research from, from the basis of facts to, to try to not just make sense of a whole oeuvre, but also to um, really make sense of individual works. For example, entrance to subway at upper, upper left. Most people would have said, I remember John Golding uh, lecturing about it, it was a generic uh, place. But you see, you see the plaques, plaques and, and, and plaques up there? Those pla plaques, they're in Nostrand Avenue subway. <laughs> That's precisely the subway where the army was. So you see, it starts to come together in that way. And the same, same about the signatures, certain types of signatures, um, definitely come from a certain date because we know that Subway in 1939 was exhibited in 1941 and it's got a particular type of signature for that period. And I was able to um, do mock-ups, my celebrated mock-ups of particular exhibitions by looking at the combination of inscriptions, 
the image itself, the colours and so forth. And, and for example, these are the lists, the only lists, they're not Rothko's, they're Betty Parsons, but they sometimes will have a number nine on and you'll find a number nine on the painting, things like that. And I always used to say to both museums and collectors, I'm not interested in the front of a painting, I want to see the back. And the back, is, the back is its life history, hopefully, in many ways. And um, you see, lower, lower right, that particular kind of spiky, distinctive black signature, that was on all the paintings that were in Rothko's 1949 show of Betty Parsons. Um, and this enabled me, as you can see, uh, that's the photo of Rothko sitting in this show, 19... 19 um, 1950, actually, uh, but most of the paintings in it were done in 1949, and they, too, had a specific kind of signature style in red, and I called it Carolingian because it's rather like that. So. And I was able then uh, to get that photo, put all the paintings together, and then um, do a mock-up, a ground floor mock-up of all the paintings there. You know, a matter of fakes, and I don't talk too long, uh, but on a matter of... Actually, I'm not too bad, am I? No, a few more, a couple more minutes. Yeah. On a matter of... Um, Fakes. Well, it's very interesting because you're going to go into a huge legal area. And that then was something that really never bothered me at all. I mean, I <coughs> took enormous risks. And I remember I was in a gallery in Los Angeles uh, to look at the painting. And the painting's owner was there. And I said, I'm terribly sorry, but it's not a Rothko. And I, no one, no one on earth would do that now. It's a changed climate, and this is a whole legal area which needs to be looked into with regard to a catalogue's reasoning. The key thing about uh, Rothko's is that um, he used small brushes, and you see up, up, upper right, and then the detail of an authentic Rothko, lower right, very, very delicately painted. Big paintings done with fairly small brushes, and take a look at those in the Royal Academy's octagon in the show, and you'll see, uh, in some cases, extraordinary minute things, and it can't be done with a big brush. And what distinguishes fakes like those on the left and the center, it, it, this is official connoisseurship. It's not just something you can do by rote. You really have to look very hard. What distinguishes those two is they're very coarsely painted. It's as simple as that. You know? um, and also, I have to say something, because earlier this year, a certain work by a certain artist was sold at a certain auction house. And a certain person at that auction house said that the work was going to be included in a supplement. We've known now for at least three years that there is no supplement. And it's not in the catalogue reasoning. And you see, it's a very, very provocative area. I, I started to say something but was told to shut up on Facebook. Um, I, think, I think it's genuine, but that's not how you should present a work that is not in the catalogue ways. It needs to be done, be done with total transparency. And um, I'll just go on a little longer. Um, sometimes, um, I think, an interesting aspect of catalogue ways is what other fruit comes out of them. And, and you certainly want to see exhibitions coming out of them for example, or perhaps another book of different kind. I mean, I, I did the uh, so-called Rothko Chapel exhibition at the Benil in uh, to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Rothko Chapel in 1996. And, and um, in all the modesty, Christopher Rothko said this is the greatest Rothko show you'd ever seen. But that was the last nail in the coffin for the National Gallery of Art. They said, you, you can't do this. Now, well, whilst you're doing that, you know, but the truth, truth is, as I pointed out to, to Walter Hobbs, it was doing that which helped me to understand a number of the late paintings. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting process. And other things like, I, if you're doing a, a catalogue raisonné of, of a, an artist who was not abstract or not abstract at some of the time, you have to put, put art historical ideas in there. And that's Rothko's, what I call the so-called Jewish still life, up the top. You see the talent hat. And that's almost, you see the very odd object there. That almost certainly relates to Cezanne's very famous still life with the black clock. It's all there. And 
Uh, for lower down, you see, during the war, around 1944-45, Rothko starts doing um, these very interesting abstractions. And what I discovered was that the motifs come out of Jewish Bibles, uh, certain types of motifs like uh, formalised. Now, the question is, and I, I'd like to hear this answered, is should the catalogue raisonné, I'd like to wind up very quickly, should the catalogue raisonné um, have a long text? If so, what kind of a text? Or should it be perhaps a few multiple authors? And now this very much, to my mind, uh, affects the whole, the whole nature of the catalogue raisonné. I mean, Francis O'Connor, who did the Pollock, said to me, you should never have written the introduction uh, because it's supposed to be absolutely factual. And I said, Francis, if you have to burn the first 100 pages or the remaining 600 pages, then I'd rather see the remaining 600 pages burnt because anyone could do the catalogue, but only one person could do the introduction. And you have to be totally immersed in the artist to be able to do that. And at the end of the day, um, it came out, and I think it was one of the very first um, catalogues raisonné to be done with the works more or less in proportion up to a point. Before that, there was just one work after another. But Rothko's sizes varied from a minute to the huge and here, you know, this is where the designer came in because I was incredibly fortunate. Not just the, the, the publisher was very important. I mean, without the publisher, you would never have had it uh, with the first hundred pages of text. But then the designer was very, very important because it's how it looks. And, and in my case, the designer was a very famous designer, Derek Birdsall. And um, he, he wrote that article up there, up, up left. And he said one very interesting thing. It was going to be in one volume, but my job, Derek said, is to make space. And, and in making the space, we're also able to make the proportionate sizes of the reproductions. And I think, yes, as a last point, uh, I'll wrap it up. There's something, you know, quite um, philosophical about catalogues raised in there. And as I was reading through, and great, the great humanist scholar, scholar uh, George Steiner, one of his essays, he brought up the idea of catalogues reasoned and scrupulous as being a sign of a civilised intellectual order of society. And when they go, it's like, you know, other things going. And um, the other thing in the middle I came across that is that the factual ones are not necessarily as factual as they look. It's sometimes, and I know this from the inside, sometimes... Because the presentation of fact can hide a multitude of sins. Uh, but it's, if they look like that, then there's a Chinese wall around knowing what's actually behind it. And on the very last point is that Frank Camo, the great literary critic, carnal readings are much the same. Spiritual readings are all different. What he's saying there, he's talking about texts, but it might as well apply to a catalogue way, isn't it? The purely factual catalogue way, isn't it, is a carnal reading. The one that has interpretation and many other things feeding into it is what Kermode would call a spiritual meaning. And I will always come down on the side of a second. Thank you very much. Uh, David, thank you so much. We really appreciate you um, being with us and kicking things off today um, so compellingly really giving a sense of the, 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 the drama of that, that creative process uh, that was involved. And um, I guess if we all want to see that kind of summarised, distilled uh, understanding of the subject matter, we should all go and see the exhibition at the Royal Academy. Now, I'm going to move on now to introduce up here James Rawlin, who for 10 years was head of modern and post-war British art at Sotheby's, but it says here has since escaped to Suffolk, where he is now enjoying a career as an independent curator an advisor to many different uh, collectors and galleries. Over to you, James. Thank you very much. I think I might have drawn the, uh, the difficult one to follow. Um, I've been asked to speak to you today from a, a very distinct standpoint, which is of someone involved in the commercial side of the art world. And as such, some of the points that I might raise um, could well set the teeth of 
one or two of the more academically minded amongst you slightly on edge. However, it's a very simple fact that a large part of selling a work of art is concerned with gathering together really quite a, a, a disparate number of pieces of information. And that helps us to make the case as to why somebody should buy or sell a particular work as opposed to another one. And amongst those, you find the power of the image, obviously, the historical importance of the work, its exhibition history or lack of that, and provenance and uh, you know all the things that go together those make up the jigsaw that becomes a successful transaction in the commercial art world. And much of this information we find amongst, uh, between the covers of a catalogue resume. But when I first started working with modern British art in 1990, there was rather a dearth of literature on many of our major artists. And catalogue resume were very few and far between. We, we had one or two beacons, like the, the multi-volume uh, Henry Moore Foundation publications, but that was very much the exception rather than the, the rule. And for a number of important names, the main resources that we had to work with were biographies, memoirs, uh, those slim catalogues from regional galleries in the 60s and 70s, some of the Arts Council publications, and the monographs and catalogue resume we had, if they had some sound and, and solid information and hopefully some good colour plates, they were objects to cherish. And as the years have passed, my bookshelves have slowly filled with quite a large number of, of catalogue resume, which, of course, we must all realise is a good thing, yes? Yeah? Well, not always. <laughs> if I give you a little imaginary scenario, I'm sitting at my desk and the telephone rings, and I find myself speaking to a collector who wants to talk about a particular painting or sculpture. This might be as a buyer or as a seller, doesn't really matter in this circumstance. But as soon as they've given me the barest information, I can go to the shelf, appropriate shelf in my library, take down the catalogue resume, look up the work under discussion. There I have wonderful, accurate colour image. I've got all the physical details of the work. I've got the complete provenance, the literature, the exhibition history, with a bit of luck, a nice contextual note. And that relates it to other works by that artist that I know or, or by other artists. And my conversation with that collector now proceeds from a very informed standpoint. But there is also the flip side of that. The telephone rings, etc., etc. I go to the shelf in the library, and always assuming that there is actually a catalogue resume on that artist, I take down the book. And then I wrestle with all those little hurdles, like a lack of or a very poorly referenced index, tiny little plates that are separated from the things so I'm flicking back and forth through it, fuzzy little images, all the, you know, sometimes, you know, information that's a little bit garbled and diff difficult. And I mean, this isn't, I'm not lying, the, some, there are some like this, I've got them at home. And that really compromises my ability to have a, a sensible and useful confirmation, conversation with the client who may be considering spending these days quite a lot of money. So you might all just think, well, that's, you know, poor old James, he needs to be doing his own research, what a shame. <laughs> but, I've, I've, you know, this raises a very serious question for people like me who work in the commercial sector of the art world. The spectrum of publications that we have to work with is exceedingly wide, and it goes from things that are absolutely de rigueur to some which are well nigh unusable. And obviously some of the older catalogues have suffered with um, particularly works that have come to light in the interim and extra scholarship that's, that's happened. Um, but some of the more recent publications are not as easy to use and as not as helpful as they, as they might be. And this, of course, is partly because, for us, the catalogue resume is primarily a tool. 
and it's a tool that has lots of different uses. In the hands of a university lecturer, a student, or a researcher, it serves a very different strand of purpose from that which an auction house specialist, a dealer, or an appraiser will put it. And in my departmental library at Sotheby's, you could generally tell which were the catalogue resume that we found most useful because they were so battered and dog-eared. And they were filled with notations, post-it notes with additional information, information about collections and owners, um, where things had changed hands, and sometimes, dare I say it, the odd correction. And these battle-scarred resume that we had sitting on the shelf um, those were the best tools that we had for the job. And in order to perform that function, those tools had a re one prime uh, factor, which was information. Sound and clearly presented information. In the commercial art world, we need to be able to identify the work in question, trace its exhibition history, link the provenance together, and pro provenance is, is, I think, you know, David touched on this, how you pull a piece into the realm of the sort of continuous history, uh, provenance is such an important element. And we want to be able to check the references to other literature, we want to be able to see how it fares when it's, when it's um, been written about by other writers, and we want to see how this piece stands up. And we need this information to be trustworthy. So therefore, the most successful catalogue resume are, to us, invaluable. They add one other piece to the jigsaw. So therefore, you might be thinking that I want more of the same. You know, wheel out those authoritative volumes. Well, a good catalogue resume, even a good catalogue resume, isn't always the absolute answer to the gap on my bookshelf. As many of you know only too well, producing a work of this type takes time, a long time. Even once the research is done, which of course it never really is, the physical production of the, of the book itself can run on and on. And many of the times when we see in auctioneers' catalogues that line to be included in the forthcoming catalogue resume, and we see that for years and years. <laughs> we used to actually have a little cut and paste bit that we would put into the catalogue, they just change the name. Um, and you can absolutely guarantee that even once you've given the final sign off, it is sod's law that something unknown will turn up. I once asked an author to come in and uh, visitors in advance of, a, of an auction to see some pieces that we had coming up uh, by an artist she was writing about. And on seeing these four paintings, she declared that she was delighted and frustrated in equal measure. Of the four, one she knew very well, one she'd only known from a tiny ancient black and white photograph in an archive, one was known by title from a, uh, an old catalogue entry, and the last one was completely and utterly unknown. And she'd given the printers their final go-ahead the day before. As you can imagine, she was a little bit frustrated. And therefore, if we're dealing with a large body of work particularly, are there ways that that information can be allowed to build gradually while, um, while a catalogue is in production, just to start to keep people informed, um, and make it available to users. I mean, I like nothing better than having information to go to. Um, and knowing that a catalogue is going to appear in 10 years' time is, well, it's wonderful to know it's going to happen, but there's, there's going to be a need for it in the, in the interim. So online catalogues, of which there are one or two, they do have a benefit in that they allow a continual update of new works and informa any information that comes to light. And it particularly, and I know this is something that exhibition curators value, is when you can see how pieces have changed hands. And 
many is the cattle of Rosene from even from relatively recently that you look in and you see the whereabouts of a work and it's changed hands in the interim. If it's changed hands publicly, that's very helpful because you can go and, and go through that institution. But if things have changed hands privately, it can be exceedingly difficult to trace where a thing has gone. And the quality of that information really is, I think, probably quite key in dictating whether a catalogue resume, certainly of the two differing types that um, David mentioned, whether that is actually the way forward. Um, you know, whether you're an academic, a collector, or a commercial agent, it's that sound information that makes the publication valuable to you. And if that artist was somebody who kept absolutely rock-solid records from day one, from their earliest records, they cross-reference their correspondence, they have everything photographed, then brilliant. But that doesn't sound like most artists I've ever had to deal with. And also, you've then got to look at where does that information come from? Is it information from the time, or is it information that's been put together subsequently? And, you know, we have to accept that artists' estate, and particularly artist families, do inevitably have, however small, a, a slight slant in their approach to um, the subject. And thus, the need for the writer of a catalogue resume to be able to exercise strong and sometimes probably rather unpopular critical judgment is essential. And, of course, if the artist is still alive and involved in the project, uh, I think that makes it doubly complicated. For example, I, over the years, have seen um, many collectors with letters from one particular post-war British artist congratulating them on their ownership of one of his very finest works. Well, I mean, all the collectors were delighted that they had this document and were very happy to show me this. But it simply wasn't true. I mean, when they came to us, they usually came to us for evaluation for sale. And we had to take that into account, obviously. But... You know, when it says this is my very, one of my very best works and it's worth a, a tiny proportion of what a very best work should be, you realise that that artist was perhaps not being entirely straight with them. And then also, what do we do about, you know, ensuring that the catalogue resume is that complete or as complete as we can be collection of authentic works by an artist? You know, the decisions that have to be made as to what is to be included and what is left out, you know, these are, are quite serious issues. And, of course, as the art market has changed over the last, uh, the last two decades, the values and prices involved have meant that whether something is or is not included really have become quite significant. What do we do about collaborative works? What do we do about part-finished works? Um, occasionally you see something which will be quite clearly referenced in the literature as a part finished work but often when they appear uh, for sale that's just slightly brushed under the carpet and of course the, the catalogue has to be the thing that we go back to to say actually this is the case what about when artists fall out with the owner of a piece by them and then in spite deny the authenticity of a, of a particular work. I mean, there are several occasions when that's happened. Will there be some form of committee or expert opinion to cover those works that come to light after the publication? You know, all these works sort of sit in a hinterland and they have to be judged somehow. And if it isn't done well and done with authority, it can undermine the credibility of the whole project in the eyes of the art market. And the ability of a catalogue resume to deal with the, quest with the area of questionable works has considerable um, potential for problems. And in the modern world, people expect to get answers quickly. They want to know now. And this ability to find that information um, 
one example where that pops up on a regular, relatively regular basis is where something is shown to a major dealer or a major auction house, they get a, 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 an opinion from a recognised expert who turns it down. The piece goes back to its owner, and then some time later it pops up in a regional auction, maybe in another country, as what it's purporting to be but isn't. And the complications there are legion. You, c you can't blame a small auction house in the middle of nowhere for, buy for not buying a hugely expensive catalogue. They may never see another work by that artist again. Uh, and certainly with 20th century work, it is, it is very common. But it, is, it, it really does cause problems. I had a situation like that only about two weeks ago. And... There you go. Ooh. So... Let me just um, do a bit of editing there. Um, so if our artists deserve a catalogue resume and we want to publish the full breadth of the work, are we actually doing them a favour? Because, yes, there is a perfectly good scholarly reason for doing it, but from an artistic art market point of view, if you imagine a, a period during which an artist absolutely shines, there may be a 10-year period that absolutely every collector wants to hone in on, but then you've got the rest of the career that they don't. Being terribly, sort of, with my art market hat on, um, showing them the work that is academically and uh, historically very interesting sometimes can be rather off-putting. Sometimes it can take away the luster of those great years. And I know you won't like me saying it, but that's how things often happen. Um, I mean, there are, of course, no correct answers to any of this. The requirements of academic study and the commercial markets often differ. But if we're all thinking that the purpose of any study is to lift the profile and really celebrate the achievements and abilities of the artists. We're probably not really that far apart. It's just finding the ways in which we use that tool. And make it, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Great stuff. Um, so having heard from the point of view of uh, an author and from the market, we're now going to ask uh, Mark War, please, to um, come up. Uh, Mark is here as Head of Innovation and Research at DAX, Design and Artist Copyright Society, where he is spearheading a special project helping artists and artist estates uh, develop their archives. Mark, over to you. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I think the where, where I arrive is uh, where the kind of the, the, the edges of the catalogue raisonne begin to implode, explode, and kind of um, pixelate in a kind of digital haze. Um, and I'm going to talk about, I, I suppose, uh, obviously a little bit about Art360 and how some of the experiences we're, we're, we're having in artist studios um, might be enlightening for, for the conversations today. Um, so Art360 is a, a new project. It's, it's organised by um, DAX, DAX Foundation, in partnership with Arts Council England, uh, the Art Fund, the National Archives, uh, Henry Moore Institute and other partners. And the ambition of the project is to address what we see as a kind of um, a, a widening kind of crisis culturally. And that is the question about legacy management for artists and artists' estates in a moment in which... Um, particularly in the UK, we're at a very um, uh, exciting period. You know, there's incredible kind of production in terms of the uh, British art artists, but also in terms of the British art market. So in that moment, what are artists and their estates um, able to uh, use in, in terms of thinking about managing their, their um their legacies. And, and I suppose, again, the primary point about Art360 is around the thought that actually the inventory, the organisation of all of these facts, the marginal notes about actually what artists think should be in and out um, are much more accessible when the artist is alive and can talk about that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
And the range of artists we're working with is, is very diverse, but one of the, one of the um, aspirations of the project was precisely to work with artists um, across a variety of gender, across a variety of um, regional location, across a variety of practice, across a variety of age, in order to think about what the universals are around um, legacy management and what the specificities are. So we are working with um, painters, sculptors, etc. Um, um, but some of the artists we're working with are definitely working with very challenging materials and very complicated bodies of work. So an artist like Lillian Lin, for example, sculptor, but a sculptor who's really challenged the medium of the materials that she's working with to a degree where she has to have been the, um, the uh, absolute innovator of what those materials can do. And so, with a work by Lillian Lin, sometimes they're quite, they're quite simple. You could easily take a photograph of it, put it in a raisonné, and say, job done, we know the details and the facts. But there are other works which use certain technologies, which in their time were leading edge, but have become problematic, as all technologies now do, which you might need much more complicated detail in order to understand what the work was, what the idea and the concept of the work is, and then how that work might exist in a future time. And it's those kind of boundaries that we're, we're finding um, very increasingly in the project. Um, so w part of the project that we're, you know, that, that we're engaging in is actually obviously just going into artist studios. And, that, and that's what I think the, the fundamental thing I wanted to communicate today. Um, it's going into the artist studios and it's actually understanding what, what the kind of flow, what the workflows are, what the materials they are using, and how, in some senses, we might be able to support them. And um, around that kind of question of support are very, very simple things. They are, do you have an inventory? How is that inventory organized? What's the logic you bring to decide works which are inside and out of it? And then how um, would you communicate that to a third party? Um, and what we found is, obviously, most of the artists are pretty disciplined. They actually do have inventories. If those inventories are kind of coherent enough to share with per third parties, is sometimes debatable, and we're obviously bringing in um, resources to help them refine some of those inventories. But it, it, it's at the centre. It's what is the kind of quality of organisation and information that an artist can work with, and what are the kind of solutions um, which we might be able to bring to bear. Thanks. Uh, Lillian Lynn again. Okay. And so... The fundamental question that, that, that we're, we're at is what is the, the, the future of that inventory and it, is that inventory part and parcel of a relation, relationship to a, um, a catalogue resume in a post-internet age? As we move, again, one of the things that we absolutely are finding is there's, there's this um, you know, sort of seismic crack in time and organisation. And I think it's probably about 1996, 97. So when we go into artist studios, up until that time, you will see folders and files. You will see things which are, in some senses, easy to touch. In an art historical point of view, all of that dating material, all of that kind of critical insight is there and it's tangible. The letters, the coffee stains, those kind of things. However, what you also find is there's an increasing amount of material which hasn't been, hasn't been touched, hasn't been touched for the last 10 years, last 20 years, last 30 years, because there's not a methodology for or resources to digitize it. So a lot of that material is actually, in some senses, in stasis. But also, what's absolutely more challenging is after that time, as we move into the digital and into the post-internet age, all of the kind of stuff the thinking that artists do is actually, um, it, it, it's inside of the networks, it's inside of their email, it's inside of folders on hard drives which they may or may not have kept. And, and that is what's really fascinating in terms of the resume. The, the visibility of what artists do in their studios and how we represent that is now, in a, we think, in a very critical moment. Um, 
And the, the other thought around, I suppose, from our, from our interest in what we're trying to do with Art360, it's definitely about thinking about the margins. It's thinking about the edges of contemporary art and how we're true to that as a kind of cultural legacy, but also in, the, in order to think about it as an economic legacy. If you don't have any kind of materiality, it's quite hard to capitalise an artist's legacy. However, it's not impossible. And the example of um, Tina Segal, I think, is a great one to just, just you know, that catalogue resonate. What is it? You, we can't say that Tina Segal is not an important artist. He absolutely is. However, what is the catalogue resonate for an artist like Tino Segal? And, and it's just that, it's just the immensity of that question, I think, that we have to be thinking about as we go forward. Um, but we are also working with artists working in kind of more traditional forms. I mean, there's, there's, there's a real appetite to help um, artists and artist estates to rationalise the materials they have. Um, this is uh, uh, Crispin Wright, the son of Austin Wright, in the studio um, where his father worked and we've been helping them uh, do some documentation and move forward where they would like to organise that legacy and thinking, you know, there's, there's, there's a, an amazing body of work. It's ripe for a catalogue resume. Um, but we're, we're in really kind of tangible and vulnerable spaces. You know, this, is, this is a space that needs to be properly documented. And the artists and artists' estates we're working with, for example, the artist's estate of Jeff Keane, uh, that's an incredibly valuable archive in terms of British film culture. And the resources around that estate in order to stabilize it, communicate it not only nationally but internationally are very, very finite. So, in terms of the economics of the resonate, yes, the resonate allows um, the market to better integrate with the uh, body of the work of an artist, but it's also a barrier in some senses for some artists who don't have the resource in order to stabilize and make the market confident in what works they have. Um, again. So the question about technologies, Lillian Lin, obviously she's working with um, uh, MIDI technologies, et cetera, computers, she has one of the first um, Apple Macs, but we're also working with artists who are the leading edge, not in terms of just the internet art, but new media practice. So for example, Keith Piper um, did some amazing uh, exhibitions in the mid to late 90s using um, the director platform, which is a, a programming platform uh, where you can uh, animate media and make installations. That platform is, is now redundant. So in terms of kind of thinking about the catalogue resume, how do we also think about the kind of software environments in which today's artists are working and in the future are very difficult to, to um, imagine how they can be sustained. So we have to rethink the logic of um, documenting that work in its original state, but also going forward to think about what would be acceptable in terms of its reconstitution, potentially using other softwares which might emulate that environment. Is that the work or is that a simulation of the work? Those kind of questions are the ones we're going to be thinking about. And the, the pathway into all of these ambiguities is certainly very easily accessed through photography. So in photography, the, the market is... is very strong. So if you go to uh, you know, international art fairs now, obviously photography is a very major part of that. But actually, if you talk to any of the, the gallerists, they will, they will assure you that it's still tricky to talk about um, editions and the stability of editions. And again, going back to the example of the, of the, um, the, the photographer who, who may or may not um, remember what editions they've done, what, what um, photographs they've, they've given away, etc. And obviously in the era of digitization, that's that's again, it's a very, very problematic situation when it's very easy to share um, a high resolution file in order to do some promotion or do a one off um, exhibition and then forget to um, retrieve that file. And so the whole kind of question about the vulnerability of the body of work is, is, is just exasperated. Um, so when we're working with artists such as Richard Billingham, who's very, 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 very well organised. Um, so there, there is a, a, a meticulous system that the artist has, but to translate that into a resume about works which he thinks are his work and those works which are studies, etc., 
That is a kind of critical question. And, it's a, and I think, again, for us, it's a question of we want to put the artists in a position of power uh, as, as much as is possible. So they're making the decisions, and they're making that as clear as possible. Uh, next. Yeah. Um, so here's a great uh, photographer who some of you may have seen in the recent um, Tate show, may, may still be on, uh, John Hilliard. And John is a, is, um, a really enthusiastic destroyer. He loves nothing more than actually to go through his body of work and, and, and say, no, that one is dead. Take it out, smash it up, burn it, it's no more. Um, and, and he's a, a good example of an artist who would be um, you know, really upset if work which is not in his mind up to the mark was then exhibited and sold and, or you know, contained a resume. So, and yeah, so for example, the drawings, you know, I don't think he wants those to be sold as his works, but they're critical to an understanding of how he actually constructs his work. This is an incredible set of drawings which define each of the, of the works. So the process in which he can, makes the very minimal conceptual works is very, very extensive. So from an art historical point of view, a curatorial point of view, this is amazing material, um, but it's not what he would consider to be the work. Um, and this kind of question about um, photography obviously also transfers into film and digital film particularly where artists won't make one version of a work they'll make multiple editions of a, of a film work so the question of what, what their rushes uh, mean as a relationship to a work that is very very problematized next some artists um, obviously are much easier to think about in terms of their kind of future trajectory um, in the ways they might stabilize the work. So this is David Batchelor in his studio. And the last slide, again, yeah. Working on the ordering of the specificity of his color palette, etc. There's going to be no doubt about what is in the catalogue resume of David Batchelor because he's working in detail today. Um, so that, that's enough for me. But yeah, the sense for Art360 is looking at the ways in which artists become the central um, uh, organizers and definers of their body of work and are put into dialogue with curators um, and conservationists in their time to allow their legacy to be uh, respected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, some wonderful images there of um, artists as, as uh, self-catalogues. Intriguing.